I was just going to say we are recording this so that people who weren't able to come live can watch it again later. So welcome everyone. This is webinar three of four of our uh, series on building local resilience to climate risk with Climate Caucus. So I'm Charmaine mendes millard from Partners for Action at the University of Waterloo. And I'm so pleased that you could be here with us to talk about climate resilient retrofits for adaptation and hear a bit about the work that our students did at the beginning of this year for Halifax Regional Municipality, um, but with information and lessons that can be shared uh, across Canada. So. I'll just ask Cameron and Tyler to give a little wave. They're the ones that are presenting today along with me, but you can see on the screen, we've got um, a number of students and former students who contributed to this work, um, including Rachel Kruger, Devin Jones, Monica McHale, Nilofar Mothat, and Kalindi Shaw. So I'd like to recognize that um, as always, the students are the ones doing the hard, hard work for our research projects. Um, and thank you so much, Jane, and to others, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and the community you're coming in from, as well as in Mentimeter, uh, we've got a little poll that starts with the question of where you're zooming in from. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as I mentioned, this is webinar three of four of our Building Local Resilience to Climate Risks series. And thanks to Climate Caucus for organizing and partnering with us on this. The whole goal is to learn what efforts are underway to support local climate action, adaptation and resilience, and what you can do in your community. So we encourage you to share in the chat with each other and connect um, so that we can all learn from each other while also uh, listening to the presentation. Next slide, please. I'd like to uh, respectfully acknowledge that the University of Waterloo uh, is situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and the Neutral Peoples, whose enduring presence, contribution, and knowledges we recognize. Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land promise to six nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Um, and this is land that, um, although promised to those nations, um, has not necessarily been upheld. Um, that promise has not been upheld. And so we uh, direct you to protect the tract, uh, a website and um, an advocacy group that is trying to uphold the Haudenosaunee Confederacies uh, mandates about how their land should be used. For more about where you live and work, uh, please visit nativeland.ca. Next slide, please. Okay, so for today, we're going to uh, give you a brief introduction to uh, Climate Caucus and Partners for Action at the University of Waterloo and how our work connects to local climate resiliency. Then the bulk of our time will be spent hearing what our Climate Resilient Retrofits project team pulled together um, and the resources that we should be having available to you soon. And then, uh, of course, we'll have time for questions and answers. Throughout, though, I do um, encourage you to put your questions in the chat and Cameron will be uh, keeping an eye on those questions and, and raising them as we speak. Next slide, please. I think we're handing it over to you, Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, so Climate Caucus, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a nonpartisan network of over 650 current and former locally elected climate leaders and over a thousand allies. Um, we are leading the transformation needed for communities to thrive within planetary boundaries. Collectively, we create and implement 21st century socially just policies which align with the IPCC, the IPBES, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
Our mission and vision are uh, listed here. So our mission is to connect, support, and advocate for locally elected leaders to accelerate the transformation for communities to thrive. And our vision is that communities are leading the transformation needed to thrive within planetary boundaries. And we have defined thrive as communities that are resilient, healthy, regenerative, decarbonized, and socially just. Thank you so much, Alex. So uh, just quickly about Partners for Action at the University of Waterloo. We're a research initiative that was formed to empower Canadians to be flood resilient by promoting awareness and preparedness, actions that are inclusive and evidence-based. Next slide, please. We've been moving towards um, a multi-hazard approach, uh, applying an equity lens to the work we do, which is really centered around community-led or community-engaged efforts that fall into three main buckets that overlap, climate justice, climate action, and climate adaptation. And today our um, work really sits in the climate adaptation sphere with climate actions that you can take. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Tyler. Of the hour, uh, we have a project team that was dedicated to this research. And so I want to acknowledge them. They're the ones that pull together their, um, their insights, knowledge, and different disciplinary perspectives from engineering to environment. And so I recognize uh, not only Cameron and Tyler, but all the students you see here that did this work. Next slide, please. Okay, so your turn, just really quickly. Um, we've got our Mentimeter poll. So where are you from? Uh, what community are you Zooming in from? And the question after that will be, what hazards are you most concerned about in your community? So Tyler, if you don't mind stop stopping sharing, I will go to Menti at this point. Okay, so. Um, we're on that question of where are you from, where are you zooming in from, and we can see a bunch of people from Vancouver. I think I saw Wilma from uh, BC Housing there. Thank you for joining us, as well as other people from the area. Sue, Halifax, Durham, and Ontario, Lethbridge, Venezuela, amazing, Amloops, so Gulf Islands, City of Coquitlam, great in Toronto. Thank you. So it's great to see a diversity of people here. The next question is, what hazards are you most concerned about in your community? You can put, I think, up to three. So when I say hazard, I'm talking about floods, wildfires, heat, drought, um, hurricanes, wind, snow, and ice those types of things. Okay, so not surprising um, what we're seeing here. So heat, wild wildfires and flooding, we've seen across Canada in the last few years, so many events that have affected so many people in multiple ways. Uh, we also have sea level rise, blackouts, so power outages, perhaps uh, from ice storms or high winds, snow load, water shortages, drought, and smoke, extreme thunderstorms. Okay, yes. So this really does align with what we're seeing um, in the research as well with what uh, uh, re resilient retrofits are out there and what people have been um, talking about. So they've mainly, uh, we had a lot of results around flooding, for example, um, and then followed by other ones. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. You can keep sharing overheating. Yes, flood and erosion, eco-region shift, interesting, yes. Okay, and tornadoes. Tyler, if you don't mind sharing the screen again, please. Oh. 
Can you see that? Okay, next. Yes, yes, thank you. Next slide, okay. please. Uh, so, so yeah. yes, I'll hand it over to I'll take over for a bit here. So um, as we saw prominent there, um, flooding was our one of our big ones in our Mentimeter poll. Um, this image is from the Coldwater River in BC in 2021. Um, we've seen that flooding is now becoming Canada's most frequent and expensive natural disaster, uh, and that's only expected to grow. Um, so a lot of homes damaged here, a lot of flood water. Um, so one of the big ones we've seen. So go to my next slide. Um, another increasingly likely extreme weather event we've been noticing in the research is hurricanes. So with increasing open ocean temperatures, more powerful hurricanes are able to push further north. Uh, this is an image of Fiona in 2022, uh, which hit much of Atlantic Canada. And we're only expecting more of these to be able to push further north as those open ocean temperatures warm. Um, similar on that high and winds. Tyler, I am going to interrupt yeah. really quickly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt quickly because I see Jessica, you make a really good point. There's even um, a movement now and there's a website called, I think, No Natural Disasters because making the point that uh, hazard events become disasters because of human choices. So there's no such thing as a natural disaster. It's really a human made disaster because of the choices that we've made. Um, so. We are going to try and not talk about natural disasters, but we'll talk about disasters. And thank you, Deb, for sharing that. Sorry, Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, that's no problem. And that's a very good point about this, that a lot of the times it's our choices and the risk we accept and how we build our structures that we see a lot of these damages. Um, along with the high wind side of things and our middle of the country region here in Waterloo, what we've seen is um, a lot more tornado activity. So these images are from Dunrobin near the Ottawa area in 2018. Um, we've noticed and climate scientists have noticed that a lot more of this warm, humid air is being pushed farther north. And this is bringing more favorable weather conditions for those tornadoes to develop in the Ontario and Quebec region specifically. Um, I think now I'm passing it off to Cameron uh, as she goes into wildfires. Yeah, so another hazard um, that we've looked at and that is um, quite prevalent, uh, we've had the worst wildfire season uh, this year with 18.5 million hectares burned in Canada in 2023. Um, so that's record breaking. Um, I've personally had to almost evacuate a wildfire and I bet lots of people in this call have shared that experience. Um, so this is um, a very scary um, and prevalent um, hazard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next was uh, wind and, or sorry, ice and snow. Um, these can cause down power lines and down um, tree branches, as well as um, they come often with high winds. Um, so this is another disaster that can cause a, a lot of issues for infrastructure and for people. Um, next slide, please. Um, extreme heat is another one. So um, extreme heat, of course, is uncomfortable, but it's especially important that we recognize how deadly it is. Um, 619 people died of heat exposure in BC in 2021. Um, and that's way too many considering how preventable that would be. Um, so next slide, please. As our world is warming, uh, climate scientists are saying that these extreme events are gonna become more frequent and more widespread. So it's super important that we um, do something about this and we adapt and adapt immediately. So I'll pass it on to Charmaine. Thanks so much, Cameron and Tyler. So uh, I'm gonna tell you about the challenge we were given and what we did. So uh, Halifax Regional Municipality, um, as many of you were facing uh, increased events and a feeling of, well, what should we do about it? And how can we encourage change in our community? Uh, so they had a project for us to do some research into what retrofits exist for their hazards of concern. Next slide, please. I really wanna take a minute to thank the 
uh, Halifax Regional Municipality for the funding for this research and to acknowledge that really it's their um, climate action strategy, Halifax, that um, enabled and uh, was a guidepost for this work. So it's an example of where you have a strategy and now what information do you need to implement it? Next slide, please. So we broke this into uh, a few research questions. What retrofits are available for five building archetypes uh, because they were interested in residential and non-residential buildings that may reduce the impacts of eight climate hazards? Um, and I put an asterisk after eight because we ended up combining them into six as you'll see in a minute. The second research question we tackled was what property level and municipal level initiatives in Canada exist already that enable the implementation of climate resilient retrofits? So once you know what to do, then what helps you do that? Next slide, please. So you can imagine that this is quite the big question. And at the time we did not see anything out there in Google, in the literature that gave us a framework for how to tackle this question. So as a team, we spent quite a lot of time uh, coming up with our framework and what information we needed to do or to get from a desktop review and how we were going to organize all the information because it was quite overwhelming. So the framework we've come up with um, is captured in the following diagram. First, we tackle the question of, okay, how can communities adapt to become more resilient to climate change? One way of doing that is to modify the built environment to projected climate impacts. Now, that's a bit of an issue because a lot of the data we have or the analyses we have are based on historical climate data. Um, so the ideal would be to project to, let's say two or even three degrees Celsius uh, global warming and have um, assessments based on that. But we, we were just going with generalizations at this moment. So once you know um, what are the climate impacts for your region, what is expected and what is just going to get worse, um, then you have to think about, well, okay, so what um, needs to be resilient. Okay, the built environment. How do we think about the built environment? There are different types of buildings. And so just like in marketing where you would come up with personas for people to, to design to, uh, we came up with the five different building archetypes, single family home, multi-residential unit, commercial building, municipally owned and operated building. And then we added a, five her a fifth heritage building. So we thought, okay, those are the types of buildings we're interested in. And then within those buildings, we might think that we're talking about the same thing, but let's be explicit. So thanks to our engineers on the team, um, we all learned the language to use for different building parts. And so things like the envelope and the envelope can include the foundation and the walls, for example, I think, right, Tyler? Anyway, I still get confused. I need to see the list. But that is the next step that we took was to think about the different parts of the building, windows, doors, walls, etc., even the surrounding area. So we could pinpoint where something needed to change or needed to be designed to withstand a specific hazard. So what do buildings need to adapt to? You can see our slate of hazards. Uh, we had extreme precipitation and flooding. We grouped that into one. Drought, heat, wildfire, wind, and then snow and ice. Again, we grouped it together because of uh, what we found in the literature. And then finally, uh, to tackle this whole uh, question, we had uh, not only a desktop review of the retrofits themselves by hazard at first, but also the enabling conditions. Go ahead, Tyler, next slide is fine. Uh, so we did a scan of the initiatives for property level retrofits, but we also did a scan of municipal funding um, or funding that could be accessed by communities to enable retrofits. So for example, um, 
let's say in this case, this is Halifax specific, but you can think in your community, uh, what are the building archetypes specific to your community? So for instance, single family residential homes, what are the materials most commonly used? In this case, we chose a one to two story wood frame building. Um, same with, let's say a commercial building. In your community, what is typical? In this case, one story steel joist frame building with flat metal roof. So you can get the idea. So that's the first step um, to be designed to. Next one, please. And again, that objective is just to establish a common vision and a common language. Just a little bit of a lag here. Okay, the next thing we see when the slide appears is, hmm, let me close uh, some of my apps and see if that makes sense. Can you hear me better now? Okay, I will close my video. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Okay, so uh, one of the steps we took, as I mentioned before, is to do a review of the projected climate change impacts for Atlantic Canada and specifically Halifax, and do a review of how those hazards affect buildings. So in this case, we've got floods and then the impact on building systems in general. Next slide, please. So it really is that question of resilient to what? Then the students came up with an inventory of retrofits and initiatives and put them in a database. So it was, it's really the, the core of what we're going to be sharing with you, but I wanted to just share, this is how they organize the information to identify the retrofits that um, Clean Foundation, who's doing a pilot, could implement on homes. Next slide, please. I mentioned before that we not only did um, a scan for retrofits for hazards, but they also looked up funding programs that municipalities and communities can access for enabling re resilient retrofits. This is meant to be a living resource. It'll always change, um, but we thought this would be useful for people and especially when it comes to thinking about the funding type and having a link for the application. You know, it's just very overwhelming sometimes to think about how to enable these things to happen on the ground. And so this is one resource that uh, we hope people will keep building on. Next slide, please. Um, I think I'll take it from here. So um, we'd like to show you a bit of what we found. Uh, we have some examples of retrofits that um, we found through this research, um, as well as going through the hazards in, in a bit more depth um, and how we approach them. But um, I just wanna be clear that this was based on a literature review where we had inclusion and exclusion criteria um, for eight climate hazards um, specific to these four uh, building archetypes that Charmaine um, was talking about. So uh, next slide, please. So we went through these a little bit, but um, just to clarify once more, the hazards that we reviewed were extreme precipitation, wildfire, snow and ice, drought, extreme wind, and extreme heat. So I'll go through each of these and talk about the retrofits that um, we found, and Tyler will talk about some as well. So the way that we thought about this was there's sort of like an overarching hazard. So in this case, it would be flood. Um, and then each overarching hazard has some subtypes of hazard, if you will. So um, in the case of flooding, you have pluvial flooding, coastal flooding, riverine flooding, and drainage failure. And then there are different impacts that each of those different um, hazards can have on infrastructure So um, and people. So that would be structural damage, water damage, debris damage, contamination, or sewer overwhelming, um, to give some examples. 
some options of what you can do about these impacts are um, first some dry flood proofing. So that would mean stopping water from entering the home completely. Wet flood proofing where you allow water to enter harmlessly. Um, barriers, so you prevent water from reaching the, the home or the building at all. Um, elevation, so you elevate the building above flood levels or relocation, um, which as we spoke a little bit about is a pretty um, big but important one considering that there are a lot of developments that are made on floodplains um, and sometimes the risk is just too high. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about um, some examples of these pressure fits, if you mind going to the next slide, thanks. Um, so the first point here on the left is dry flood proofing. So this might include some new foundation added, a sump pump or a drain, uh, masonry veneer, and other um, sort of additions to the home that would mean that water just can't get in. Um, and then the next one on the right there is backwater valves. So as you may know, um, your home has pipes that drains into the wastewater sewer. Um, but sometimes if there's uh, just too much water going into these sewers due to heavy rains or another reason, um, they can back up and then the flow of water goes backwards and back into the home um, and it creates some pretty messy um, floods inside of homes and other buildings. So one way to prevent that is relatively simple. Um, if you install a backwater valve, basically, as you can see there, it's a flap that if the water is moving in the wrong direction, it'll just float up and block that water. So water stays in the uh, municipal system rather than coming into the home or building. Next, you can see wet flood proofing, which is a bit of an interesting one. Um, you have structural elements of the home uh, in the foundation. So, uh, and then you have non-structural parts of the home, which uh, break away when there's pressure from the water on the home. And that means that the water can actually move underneath um, harmlessly and avoiding it putting pressure on the sides, um, which some homes just can't withstand that. Uh, so that's a good solution in the case where you don't want that sort of um, inwards pressure on the house. Um, and then the next uh, example that we have here is to elevate or protect utilities. So if you have some particularly precious um, parts of the home that you can't get wet, you can create walls around them or protect them more specifically. Yeah, um, there's a question in the chat. What is DFE? Um, is that a Tyler question? I think that would be a Tyler question. I didn't specifically look at flooding to begin with, but Tyler may know. <laughs> it's the design elevation of the flood or design flood elevation for oh, the okay. theoretic three letter acronym. So it's essentially how high you expect the flood to get to and what you need to control below that, whether that's letting waters in or keeping water out, depending on the type of system. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, there's lots of jargon. It's even uh, things like the conservation authorities in Ontario have a regulatory flood line or something. And again, it's the, um, the line to which the floodplain would extend to uh, if flooded. And where they say development shouldn't occur. So there's all this jargon and half the battle is just understanding all of this. Go ahead, Cameron, thank you. Yeah, so next um, we just wanted to tell you about one example of an enabling initiative um, that'll help people implement these, um, uh, these retrofits. So one of them is the stormwater credit. Um, and so people can get a 45% stormwater utility discount if they capture water on the property. So that would be like with a rain barrel or a cistern, for example. Um, and so we wanted to pass it on to you and ask what sort of initiatives um, or incentives there are in your communities um, that can help hazards. It can be for flood or any other hazard, but um, yeah, we'd like to hear from you. I see Sherry shared um a basement flooding protection subsidy program is great. And please feel free to unmute yourself and share any other types of uh, initiatives in your communities that are designed to reduce flood risk. So for instance, I believe Toronto used to have a downspout disconnect program um, when the, the sewer and the um, water treatment or the water systems and the sewer systems used to be combined and uh 
and so the downspouts were disconnected for that. Thank you, Deb. Yes, rainwater collection. The SNAP program, oh my goodness, that is one of my favorite programs that I've ever heard of in my life. That's the Toronto um, Region Conservation Authorities program where they had, uh, for instance, at a neighborhood level, let's say you want um, certain things to be done. So for example, let's say uh, so, so many people would sign up to install a rain garden. Then part of this was to have uh, uh, the group discounts and just the work all done in, in one go. Deb, do you want to expand or did you have a different comment? Uh, it would be great to have a very simple, accessible grant program at that neighborhood or community level. Because one of the things that we need in the Gulf Islands, for instance, is um, we need resilience for energy and for uh, fire fighting. Um, but designated, not not water. Well, we also need water for drinking in the summer. But um, yeah. it's very expensive for people to consider just storing 3,000 gallons on the acreages that they don't touch. It's just for fire suppression cross -running. Thank you, Deb. It was it was a bit hard to hear um, because of your internet connection. So, but I heard that absolutely would be useful to have um, small grants to enable those types of things. And I see Cheryl Evans from Intact Center who has done work on community engagement and wildfire. Thank you, Cheryl. Go ahead. Thank you, Charmeline. I'm happy to be here. I um, just wanted to note that the Intact Center has collaborated with local uh, municipalities and the Canadian Red Cross in a really neat pilot in BC this, um, this summer. It's a resilient retrofit pilot, so um, several communities can look at uh, at the home level what are the, the residents can find out, what are their risks to flood, fire, and extreme heat. They can identify practical opportunities to reduce their risk. They can apply for uh, subsidies. They can um, implement the actions, get their money back, and participate in a follow-up study to talk about impacts and barriers. So it's quite a comprehensive study, and we'll, we'll let people know the results uh, next year. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. And if you don't mind putting in the chat um, any information or a link to that program, I'm sure people would love to follow up. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, <laughs> Cheryl, how can we participate in this program if they're in BC? You can go ahead and unmute. Cheryl? <laughs> yes, you. Sorry, you, you asked me to friend. put it in the chat, so I'm like, chat, 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 chat. That also, um, yes. <laughs> so I can I can dig up the the link, the community link, but it's it's not a, a widely run program yet. It's just specific programs, uh, communities that were impacted by uh, the 2017 wildfires. There's uh, federal funding left over for that. So I'll find the link and I'll um I'll get it back to to people so they can understand what it is. But there's limited access uh, to pilot participation at this point in time. Okay, thank you so much. And if anyone has any suggestions to reply to Deb uh, with the challenge in the Gulf Islands, um, absolutely, yes, the challenge is that you're not a municipality and so you are you don't have access to all the grants um, that others do. So if anyone has suggestions for Deb, please uh, reply to her chat. Okay, we'll move on to the next Thank you so much, everyone. Run over to you. Yeah, I'll pass it on to Tyler now. All right. Um, so our next hazard we looked at was extreme wind. Um, so this can come from a lot of different things, such as our hurricanes or tornadoes we mentioned before. Um, and oftentimes these are putting that upward force on our buildings. So in the house example, in this case, that's lifting off the foundation if our house stays intact. Um, that can also be pulling the roof off if our roof is the weak link. And then um, as we pull stuff off our buildings, that then becomes flying debris, which can go into other buildings, hit people that are exterior, things like that, causing a lot of damage. Um, so this one's a big chunk of structural damage, as we saw in a lot of probably the photos that we presented earlier. Um, things being lifted up, picked up, and move somewhere else. 
Um, so a big one we saw was securing the roof. So if you're able to secure the roof, one, your, we'll call it house of cards, essentially, that's representing your building, maintains its integrity. It doesn't just have the walls on the outside supporting it. It has that rigid stability from the roof. Um, the roof also helps to prevent water from coming in. So a lot of these storms, whether hurricanes or thunderstorms, um, are bringing a lot of water with it, which if you lose your entire roof or even parts of your roof, um, you're going to see a lot of water damage on these buildings as well, which can be quite costly. Um, and other things we saw, reinforcing doors and windows. So openings in our building, if they become broken, they let wind into the building, just increasing more force on that structure. Um, so here's some examples that we found for damage. Um, we have in Barrie, Ontario, we have the whole roof being removed from that structure. You can see some of the roof joists being left behind um, where they've been ripped off. We have a whole bunch of de debris in the bottom picture um, that, that guy's trying to clear up for his house. Uh, and then we also have an image from Toronto with one of our infill houses lacking a lot of that rigid shear wall in the short direction. Um, so it's decided to take a little rest on the building beside it, um, which the neighbor's probably not too happy about. Um, so some of the solutions we found for retrofits, again, big one, that roof connection is often a weak link. It's often a couple nails at most, um, sometimes not done very well. Uh, so more explicit roofing connections, whether that's tie down small, cheap metal plates, or full screws can be installed as well if access is a bit more limited. Um, there's also the foundation attachment. So rather than oftentimes we see no washers at all, or sometimes small washers on this foundation connection, using a larger square, thicker washer on that foundation stops the anchor from pulling through our walls. Um, and finally, for our opening protections, things like um, hurricane rated doors and windows, preventing those openings from letting wind in and lifting up our building from the inside, as well as we saw a secondary waterproofing layer. So times when our primary roofing, say shingles for a single family home fail, we still have a way to keep that water out. Um, I just saw a question in the chat as well. Are these wind resilience measures possible to implement in retrofit context? Um, to different levels of it. So depending on say if you're removing um, interior finishes and um, renovating a house, things become a lot more exposed. Um, with this secondary waterproofing layer, maybe when your roof is coming up for its say 20 year lifetime, that we wanna go in and install that and have the initiatives ready to do that. Um, but some of these structures can be a lot more concealed and hard to get to. Um, and those often require a lot more invasive retrofit and depending on our resource or risk class on it. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Tyler. Um, so it kind of leads into one of the good examples of a program we saw was in Florida, they actually have My Florida Safe Home. Um, so this was a program where the state government offered free vulnerability inspections of people's homes. Um, and they'd have a list of recommended retrofits to tackle their um, vulnerability to specifically hurricanes there. They're in a pretty big hurricane risk area. Um, so they had a list of kind of main items that they could tackle and you got a grade on your house and you got a list of sort of approved retrofits that would tackle these vulnerabilities. Um, we also found a number of more in-depth resources and more technical details on these as well. Okay, um, our next hazard we looked at was heat resilience. Um, so this is really the increased internal temperature or just the external environment of our city. So urban centers we found were pretty vulnerable to this, um, but that's not to say more rural areas aren't as well. Um, big threat on this one, as Cameron kind of mentioned, is that human health impact. Um, we also see some on the energy efficiency, the how much energy we have to use for our buildings as some other smaller impacts on this. So some of the big ones um, I can bring up, we had uh, a pretty big heat, we heat wave on the west coast of Canada and in the States last few years. Um, I'm sure quite a few on the call have experienced this. 
Um, this one I took from 2021, where we saw some crazy ones, including lit in at almost 50 degrees Celsius. Um, so some of our solutions. I just want to yep. interrupt you for a second. Sorry, Tyler. Yeah, no problem. Um, we got a question that says, can you comment specifically about cooling roof? Yeah, and I think Charmeline chimed in that urban places are subject to a lot of urban heat island effects. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. so it kind of leads into some of the solutions we found here that green spaces and green roofs can really help a lot with that, um, that heat island effect. Also, simply shading. You can see some of these solutions are using the green space from the outdoors, um, but that's more to cool the interior of our building, providing a relief space as well. A big one we think a lot of the times just for cold weather, but it can also help on our heat side of things is adding insulation to our building, um, as well as air tightness. So things like um, adding insulation to the exterior walls and roof after the fact um, help keep that cold air in and that hot air out. Um, again, some examples of this, the city of Toronto had a program um, where you could receive up to $100,000 in funding for a green roof, um, as well as some of the more technical resources we found as well that we found pretty helpful. So now I'll go pass it off to Cameron for wildfires. Yeah, is the, can't tell if my computer's lagging or, uh, there we go, okay. Um, before you move on, it seems like Chris wants to chime in, so maybe yeah. let Chris. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, did you in investigate at all um, the west facing curtain wall and the heat absorption in the, um, let's say, um, uh, in all contexts, but uh, especially multi-unit residential buildings where there's no um, shading on that west wall and essentially the condo or apartment becomes a solar oven? Did you look at that at all? Yeah, I think we did in some of our retrofits. Um, I think Monaco is the one looking into it the most. Um, but yeah, building orientation and how much you're leaving exposed on certain sides of the building is a big one that comes up. Um, we know which sides are seeing a lot of heat exposure. We can model that. Um, we have building science um, people that can give us those numbers. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had more rather than just making glass boxes on all four sides of our building. Thank you. So I'll talk a bit about um, wildfire uh, and the retrofits that we found for those. Um, so the hazards that can happen um, with a wildfire, uh, they can enter buildings or encroach on buildings. They can cause poor air quality. Um, fires can be caused by people, um, which are just a certain kind of fire. Um, and then they can also be caused by fallen power lines. So the impact of these would be damage to infrastructure, bad air quality, threats to human life and human health. Um, and so some of the options that you could um, go to to retrofit um, to prevent wildfire damage would be first watering natural areas. So that would be preventing um, uh, excessive leaf litter or um, your vegetation from drying out, which would make it into a um, a better fuel for the wildfire. Um, next would be forestry management, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, reducing the use of flammable materials in your home or around your home, fire prevention strategies, and reducing openings where fires can enter buildings. So hopefully they wouldn't, um, even if they're nearby, they wouldn't enter the building. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see on the very top left um, is a fire with uh, trees and shrubs and, and vegetation of all different heights. So this vegetation would act as what's called a ladder fuel, meaning if there's a fire going on on the ground, um, it can climb up those mid-sized um, trees and shrubs and get up to the crowns of the taller trees. Um, and as you can see in this image, it then causes a complete burn of that forest. Whereas if you ecologically manage your forest and um, ensure that there are sort of low, low, there's lower vegetation closer to the ground. And then there's the taller trees aren't so connected with um, sort of mid-sized vegetation. 
uh, you end up with ground fires that stay on the ground um, and don't affect the crowns of the tree so much. And um, you end up with less extensive damage to that forest. Um, and then next, uh, the next retrofit that we looked at was a defensible zone. So that would just be ensuring that there's space around a home. So there's nothing um, too flammable nearby. So the fire can maybe burn around the home, but not quite reach the home. And I just uh, want yeah. to point out, uh, Cheryl um, has put in the chat that Intact Center has developed free, simple, climate-ready infographics to share with residents and community leaders for flood, wildfire, extreme heat, and working with nature. Um, I highly recommend those resources. Uh, they're really easy to follow and informative. Thanks, Cameron. Go ahead. Yeah, just to answer some of these questions, um, I see Lori, you asked, so having trees away from homes means that there's no shade from can canopy. And for sure there are, um, in some cases, one retrofit will uh, have sort of negative effects towards another hazard. So um, that was an aspect of the research that wasn't very deeply examined, um, but uh, for sure, it, it would be a case-based decision. Um, you don't want to, you know, cause the worst hazard by preventing one. Um, and then Gisela, um, we, I, I didn't specifically look at wild, like this was Monica's work. Um, and I think most of it was, uh, Charmaine, do, do you know an answer to this role of deciduous species? Cause I, I don't decisions. think we were really looking um that uh, well i think i think um it was a review of um what we found in the literature when it comes to wildfire in general i don't recall her um digging into the type of tree but gisella uh you raise an ending point could you uh elaborate as to what you're thinking about in terms of the rules the role of deciduous species um, sure. I, well, we've certainly been hearing about this a lot in British Columbia. We've had forest management practices that have largely eliminated deciduous species through the use of um, large scale herbicides in forested areas. And um, this applies around communities as well as in the middle of forests, you know, which are further away from urban development. The point is that if you focus only on building forests with uh, coniferous species, you end up losing the fire protection benefits of including deciduous species because they, they act differently during fires. And mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's certainly been a hot topic in BC this year, um, just because we're starting to finally reevaluate the way that we do forest management. Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the other comments in the chat too, um, Eddie, the fact that you would uh, work with the strata. That's a whole other thing. Condo boards, the stratas. Um, that's really great. Um, having trees away from homes means that there's no shade from canopy. And Lori, you bring up a really great point. Uh, some of the retrofits, quote unquote, or the things that you can do for one hazard directly um, this is uh, the hazard. Yes. Yeah, so if you for heat, if you want to have trees near your home for shading, that would be great for cooling. Um, but then you're right. It, it is the opposite of what you want for uh, a wildfire prone area. So not all of these are uh, complementary and so for research and, and just for the development of our database will be to indicate which uh, which metrics enhance each other versus which ones might cancel each other's out. Notice I really appreciate everything in the chat. Uh, I think you cut out, Sherman. Continuing, Chris, have a quick one there. Uh, Chris? Yes. Uh, Will, do you have a quick comment? 
Yes, I do. Although you're cutting out, uh, I'll say that. Um, uh, yes, my comment is just simply um, one of the challenges that I've come up against and seen um, is that that tree canopy is also related to the um, BTU output calculations of uh, heating and cooling appliances. So if you have an existing building and you take all the trees away, you may end up not having um, right sized uh, heating and cooling equipment for the amount of um, particularly cooling, uh, but uh, the amount of heating and cooling that's gonna be required um, because it was calculated based upon the tree canopy that was there when the when the house was built or renovated. Um, so uh, it this, this one is gonna be a sticky one for us to resolve um, in this adaptation cycle. Um, very, very interrelation, uh, interrelational uh, vulnerabilities uh, at the building envelope, and uh, and the wild uh, in the the green infrastructure interface. Um, yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, I'm not sure if Charmelina is. Um, so here, but, uh, I'll move on to, oh, sorry, Deb, do you have a comment? Yeah, just <clears throat> one quick comment. Sorry, I'm not fully keeping up as fast on the chat because there's 10,000 things going on. Yeah. Um, but, um, I did just want to say that the FireSmart component that it was named in the chat about, you know, what Whistler did versus, um, what's done in the interior. <clears throat> we've been fighting that in the trust area too because we're more like the temperate rainforest area and we've been fighting like a, a different version so cutting too many trees drying it out other um aspects so it'd be really great to try and get some nuanced fire smart language out there in the world thank you yeah for sure i think another um like some next research steps for this might be to look at retrofits more specifically for BC, because it seems like um, there's a lot of interest and um, need. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I'll move on just in the interest of time. Um, if you don't mind, next slide, please, Tyler. Uh, so yeah, the next uh, enabling initiative that we looked at was the Mi'kmaq, or that we found was the Mi'kmaq um, Wildfire Resilience Initiative. And this is an educational and fire hazard mitigation program that's focused on community capacity, capacity building. So that's a really cool initiative. Um, I'll move on to cold weather. So some of the hazards for cold weather, um, these are a bit separated from like wind. Um, so it's more focused on the actual ice itself, but um, they can cause weathering of masonry, freezing pipes, hail, ice dams, and meltwater. Um, and some of these impacts are leaks, water damage, masonry damage, burst pipes, dents in roofs, broken windows, or flooding. Um, and so flooding and wet water was mostly addressed through um, the flooding research, but some options that we have to mitigate the impacts of snow and ice would be um, freezing, sorry, yes, um, freezing, keeping pipes above freezing level, removing the roof temperature gradient, which I'll talk about, um, protecting roofs and windows from hail, uh, flood adaptation strategies, or keeping masonry dry. So here we have a couple examples. Um, you can see that hail can be, I'll share that link um, in, a, in a second, but yeah. Um, so yeah, hail can of course end up being pretty big and pretty damaging to windows. So uh, a retrofit that you can do is, is essentially protect the windows. So you can use shutters, um, you can cover up um, in one way or another. Um, next is this uh, roof temperature gradient. So um, one problem with snow and ice is that if you have a really warm home and your roof isn't properly insulated and you have snow lying on top, you get melted snow um, at where the snow and the roof touch. And then that starts melting. When it reaches the gutter, it freezes, which then kind of causes the water to be trapped underneath the snow. Um, between the roof and the ice, and it can come up through the shingles and then drip into the home and cause water damage. Um, so this retrofit, or there, there are lots of different retrofits that you can do to mitigate this. Um, overall, you want to make sure that the temperatures the, of the roof is the same between the top and the bottom. So you could either add wires to heat the top of it, 
Um, you can insulate the bottom so the heat of the home doesn't affect the, the or heat the roof up so much. Um, you can install um, vents so that the roof stays cool underneath. Um, just gonna have a look at these questions. Um, there is research about the electric grid going down. Um, in our literature that we were looking at, it was mostly, um, we looked a bit at like undergrounding wires, which would help, but that's pretty expensive. Um, having uh, like backup electricity, but um, yeah. And I then, should mention um, yeah. that, so now I'm on my phone as everyone could tell my internet was cutting out. So I'm on my phone, but I, I just want to say this was um, preliminary work uh, that was done in one term and uh, there's so much to build upon. So thank you so much for all of your comments and questions and input. Uh, absolutely, we'd love to work in partnership and but continue to do this research. So I'll let Cameron just finish up with uh, a few more examples, but then we should uh, respect everyone's time and let you go. Hmm. Those are all the examples that we had. So I'm just gonna tell you, um, next slide please about the frozen pipes education campaign, which basically just helps people in Toronto um, understand how to prevent their, their pipes from freezing and bursting. And I'll pass it back to you, Charmaine. Thank you so much. So really quickly, um, when we looked into drought, uh, it's hard to think about making a building resilient to drought other than um, thinking about how drought would affect other hazards. So for instance, if it's really dry, then it could create more conditions for wildfire, but also thinking in terms of stormwater management, rainwater harvesting, and water conservation initiatives inside the home. So I won't go into this in much detail. Um, you can just flip through to the uh, past the section, Tyler, but we just wanted to let you know that that's basically what we found. Um, overall, this work does fall in line with our uh, national adaptation strategy. And so there are new funding uh, opportunities coming down the line. Um, just keep your eyes and ears open uh, because you never know what will come down, but we do anticipate funding being available for um, retrofits like this coming forward, or at least planning for it. Um, and also we've got uh, not-for-profit organizations that already do this kind of work, such as Green Communities Canada organizations across the country. Next slide, please. So um, Cameron, if you could put in the Mentimeter uh, code one more time. I cannot share my screen with you with the Menti uh, answers, but you all will be able to see um, different people's answers, I hope. And if not, please include your answers. And then what I'll do is take a screenshot of the, um, of the results and we can share it back to you with the recording of this webinar. So the question is, what is needed for the widespread adoption of resilient retrofits in your community? There was a previous question, but really at the end of the day, um, we need this, we need a new way of doing things quickly and um, across the board. And so how can we enable that to happen? It's up to all of us uh, to work together. So thank you so much uh, for your attention today and your questions. And I'll pass it back over to um, Alex to close us out. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody so much for joining today and to let you know that the recording will be available over the next few days. Um, you can head to our YouTube channel. Um, I just dropped a link in the chat and you can, uh, you can hit subscribe so that you don't miss out as soon as the video becomes available. Um, but otherwise it will be emailed out to everybody who registered on Eventbrite for this call. Um, and if you're interested in our next all call, caucus call on local resiliency, um, which will be at the end of November. Um, you can register there on the link I just dropped into the chat. So thank you so much, everybody. And I hope that you all have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, yeah, keep your questions coming and we'll uh, save the chat.
Alex, if you don't mind stopping the recording now, then uh... I don't actually have access to the recording, so I'm not sure who's recording. Oh.